Thank you, Larissa. So as Larissa mentioned, this is not my first time here. The last time I was here, I talked about cancer caregiving. Uh, I don't know how long ago that was. That was a few months ago. Uh, but I shared with the audience at that time that we're writing grants. We're actually working with the cancer support community and the other medical institutions around town in Los Angeles, uh, plus a lot of other nonprofit organizations in submitting a grant uh, to gather people, experts, if you will, and patients and caregivers, because you are the experts in your own care, right? Uh, to gather everyone together uh, so that we could look at the issue of cancer caregiving uh, and what we are doing, what we are doing right, and what, we, what the gaps are uh, in terms of caring for the cancer caregivers. I am very happy to report to all of you that as of yesterday, the Tower Cancer Foundation agreed to fund that research. So we will forge ahead, we'll push forward and move with that research. So with the help of Dr. Melanie Goldfarb at the John Wayne Cancer Institute, and Shannon Lacava, who we probably most of you know uh, here from the cancer support community. Uh, we are getting that funding and we will start that program running uh, beginning January uh, 2020. If there's any interest here to be part of that group, whether you are a patient or a caregiver or you work for a nonprofit organization, you're more than welcome to contact me or contact Shannon because uh, we will definitely need all the perspectives to look at this growing uh, issue of uh, caregiving in, in cancer. Uh, the last time I was here, we were told, I was told uh, that this was going to be an informal talk, which I really love because I wanted it to be a discussion. I came back here today and saw the setup. Now, obviously, there's a lot more people in the audience. Uh, I'm looking at this as a gauge on, on what headshot to use in the future. So I guess this headshot worked really well, brought a lot more people in. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to think it's about me, but no, really it's not about me, it's about clinical trials. Many of you are here because you want to learn about clinical trials. How many of you are here specifically uh, to learn about clinical trials, or you have specific questions about clinical trials, or what may be appropriate for you, or what you may be eligible for? Uh, I'm not a clinical trial, I'm here interested. Great. So that's, that's what I thought, that there would be a, a big interest in, in learning about the clinical trials and what the community offers. I work at St. John's, but I'm not going to just talk about the clinical trials that are uh, available at St. John's. Obviously, these slides were created by the cancer support community. I did not have uh, uh, any hand at all in, in developing the slides. So this is all about the, the content. It's, it's all from the cancer support community, and it's very fair and balanced. So whether you're at UCLA, or you're at Cedar sinai or at City of Hope, uh, this will apply. Uh, this really is about clinical trials and how important it is uh, for us to let our patients and their families know what's available in the community and what's available in, in the general medical community about clinical trials. So first of all, they uh, wanted a disclosure from me. I do not have any financial relationships with the sponsors for this program, not with Pfizer, nor, Novar nor Novartis, nor Bristol Myers Squibb. And again, the presentation was uh, developed by the cancer support community. So just a brief overview of what we will be talking about today. What is a clinical trial? So we will define what clinical trials are. And more importantly, what does clinical trials do for cancer patients? And clinical trials are not just available for cancer. It is pretty much available for any other uh, diseases, diagnosis, or conditions that you can think of. We will talk about how clinical trials work. And if you are interested, how can you sign up and participate in a clinical trial? We will talk about some of the barriers that prevent patients uh, from signing up for a clinical trial. Some of them you actually may be thinking, uh, or some of those uh, may be preventing you from joining a clinical trial. So we will discuss those as well. Uh, we will talk about the future of clinical trials, how we are looking at changing the model so that we could get more patients involved, uh, and more importantly, how you can communicate with your doctors about even just knowing what clinical trials are available for you. Uh, and hopefully we'll have time at the end to address uh, questions. We're only here for about an hour, hour and a half. And the last time I gave a talk, I entertained questions during the presentation and we actually ran out of time towards the end to cover the rest of the slides. So I will still encourage questions, but uh, if, if that turns out into a really long discussion, then uh, I may need to move forward and we can just uh, discuss things offline after.
uh, but that's not to disrespect you or anything. I just really want to get through all the content while uh, to make sure that we cover everything on the presentation. So here are some tips uh, for living in this strange new land. Once you get diagnosed with cancer, your world changes, right? I work in, uh, I worked, past tense, in neuro-oncology at the University of California in San Diego before. Prior to that, I was in a hematology unit. We were doing bone marrow transplants. And then I met Dr. Santosh Kesari, who is at UCSD, who was hired to develop the brain tumor program in San Diego. Uh, he actually recruited me to join brain tumors. And that's when I realized that my, my perspective on cancer was very different. So in hematologic cancers, leukemias, and lymphomas, uh, you get to see the symptom gradually. Like you get shortness of breath, and then it gets worse as the months progress, right? Brain tumor is very different. It's a very catastrophic diagnosis. Like you get a seizure, bam, that's it. You change your life forever. So I think uh, this, that's a great example for living in a strange new land once you get diagnosed with cancer. All of a sudden, you're in a strange new world, a world that you may not be familiar with uh, unless you have already taken care of uh, someone in the family had, had cancer and you've actually been involved in the care for them. But cancer, just the diagnosis of cancer opened up this whole new world for you. So what's really important after a diagnosis of cancer is that you need to educate yourself. Yes, we have the healthcare professionals. You have the oncologists, you have the nurses, you have your uh, social worker uh, who you will be seeing uh, every time you have an encounter in the clinic. Uh, and they will tell you bits and pieces of everything you need to know about your diagnosis. What is the problem with that model, though? There's so much to know. Like, you are overwhelmed with information. How many of you, and you don't have to raise your hands, uh, went to your first appointment, and there was an information dump? You got all the information. You get a packet this thick, and you have to go through all the packets. You have to see all these physicians. And every physician, every clinic you go to, every service you go to provides you a packet that's about an inch thick. And you're expected to learn all of that as a cancer patient, right? So. It's very important to educate yourself, but it's also important for healthcare providers like me, like the physicians I work with, to make sure that uh, we prioritize on the things that we, we tell you. You need to get support. You can't do this on your own, uh, particularly when we talk about education. So you go to your physician's appointment. A majority of us will go to your appointment by yourself. Uh, this is actually the best time to bring someone else with you, so whoever you trust, whether it's a family member or a friend, because it's always better to have another person hear what the physician or the nurse or the social worker is telling you, right? You will, together or as a group, uh, you retain more information than you by yourself alone. Uh, so it's very important to get that support in terms of education, and don't lose that hope and courage. Uh, courage to speak up, courage to ask questions, and uh, hope uh, that you're not only relying on your physician's or provider's team, that uh, hope that you also got from, from all the information and the education that you have done yourselves. So now we'll move on to a clinical trial. What is a clinical trial? The very short definition, shortest definition of a clinical trial is it's a research study. Right? But the slide here says that a clinical trial is a research study that compares a new treatment or an approach. So we're not only talking about medications when we talk about clinical trial. Uh, many of us think of clinical trials as trying to get a new drug that may not be approved by the FDA yet into the market so that we could use them to treat other cancer patients. But there are clinical trials where we already have drugs that have been previously approved but we're looking at dosing. You know, is three-week dosing better than every other week? Every week. Uh, is uh, a higher dose better than low doses spread over a couple of days? Uh, so even how we give the drugs can be a clinical trial. And there are other examples of clinical trial outside of just the therapies, outside of, just, uh, outside of drugs. In cancer, clinical trials, and th this is very important, and we'll have a couple more slides that we'll talk about that later. Clinical trials are always uh, conducted and compared against the best available treatment. One of the things, one of the barriers that we will talk about later is the, the fear of placebo. Like if you're going to go to a clinical trial, then you might fall in the arm that there's no treatment. That doesn't exist in cancer. Practically doesn't exist and cannot exist. It is 
ethically not correct to do those kinds of studies. Uh, so we will, you will still receive the best available treatment when you are on a clinical trial. A clinical trial will just add something to the best available treatment. We will talk more about that concept later as well. So these are some of the things that uh, we would do clinical trials for. Help, help prevent cancers. So what are examples of those clinical trials? Some of the hormones that may help prevent breast cancer in individuals with BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations, right, uh, uh, that, that we're using. So can those hormones prevent cancer? They're not treating the cancer. We're preventing cancer in those individuals who are at a higher risk for getting the cancer. There are clinical trials that look at diagnostic uh, techniques uh, and diagnosing cancer early. Uh, so whether a low dose CT is really effective in diagnosing early stage lung cancer, of course the answer right now is only in high risk individuals, but we only know that answer because of a clinical trial. So a low dose CT is not uh, suggested for every single population that I could just pull from the street right now, let's have you do a low dose CTs to see if you have lung cancer. It's only recommended if you fall into the high risk category and, and to know that if you're in the high risk category, we have, we have tools that actually will give numbers and will measure those things. Uh, so there are clinical trials that will determine those. Clinical trials to improve treatment for early stage tumors. So when we talk about early stage tumors and you think about a solid tumor, uh, most of those clinical trials will involve surgery because you would always have surgery first if it's surgically accessible, right? Reduce the risk of recurrence. So patients who have already completed the treatment and are in remission, uh, so they can get involved in clinical trials and we will determine uh, if the, the, the agent or a device or whatever it is is effective uh, if the, for the cancer not to come back. Improve treatment for advanced stage rare and difficult to treat tumors. Reduce side effects from treatment. There's a lot of those clinical trials now. I'll give you an example. I've been a nurse since 1999. Uh, and at that time, the 5-HT3, the Zofrans, uh, you're familiar with Zofran and Kytril, right? They were just uh, getting on the market. Before that, we did not have uh, really powerful drugs that can help prevent nausea and vomiting. Uh, so I, I heard stories. You know, I was not a nurse in the 1980s. <laughs> But I heard stories where patients would get uh, very highly emetogenic drugs, drugs that can cause a lot of nausea and vomiting. And the nurse would tell the patient to drive home as fast as they can so that when they start throwing up, they're at home throwing up and not in the car. Because we were not able to do anything else for them at that time. But because of clinical trials, we figured out the different pathways that cause nausea and vomiting. And then we developed all those 5-HTT drugs. I used to call them the Mercedes-Benz. Uh, of antiemetics, uh, but now we can call them the Teslas of antiemetics, right? Because they're really powerful and they are really effective in, in managing those side effects. Uh, and clinical trials can be used to improve survival and quality of life. I mentioned earlier that my primary uh, interest in research is family caregiving. So we actually are opening clinical trials for family caregivers as well, looking at whether a one-on-one -on -one intervention with a nurse versus an online intervention with an established national program is better in dealing with caregiver burden. So clinical trials, uh, the, what the main message here, it's not just about drugs. Uh, there's a lot of options that can be introduced in clinical trials and you can sign up for any of those if you are eligible. You need to meet the eligibility criteria to be able to uh, sign up for those clinical trials. Why are clinical trials important? I'll sum it up with the data on cancer survivorship. We have a lot more people surviving a cancer diagnosis now than we had 10 years ago. And that is because of treatments, that is because of early diagnosis, and all those things are because of clinical trials. There is a quote from the NIH, today's treatments were yesterday's clinical trials. So everything that we do today are all because of the clinical trials that were done in the past. Nothing that's applied to patients, no interventions uh, will actually be approved and will be standard of care if they had not gone through clinical trials. So that's how important clinical trials are. 
cancer death rate has dropped 18% since the early 1990s. So it reversed decades of increases. For the longest time, we just see a rising increase in cancer deaths. Uh, and because of the clinical trials and improving research, better research techniques, better research methodologies. We have two researchers here from John Wayne who work in the labs. You may not see them when you're at the bedside or at the chair side, uh, but they're working in the labs. So they are part of this clinical trial world <laughs> that, that develops drugs and then these other interventions that we have for cancer. We are seeing more and more individuals with cancer that are increasingly able to live active, fulfilling lives. So cancer is not a death sentence anymore. It's becoming, uh, you've heard this before, a lot of physicians have talked about this. They're comparing it to diabetes, where it's becoming more of a chronic disease. CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia, used to be a death sentence when you have that. Now with a pill, just a pill that was developed, they're living five years, 10 years, 15 years. The patients who were involved in the clinical trials are still alive uh, because of that one pill that was developed for CML. Uh, so that's, that's how much progress uh, we're we're actually getting just from, from the clinical trials. I'm not sure if I'm going to cover this later, if we have slides about this, but one of the biggest things you, you may ask, why don't we have a lot of enough clinical trials then? Like, why don't everyone should be on clinical trials? Like, well, number one, they're expensive. They're very expensive to run. And so the resources are, are very difficult uh, to acquire to be able to run clinical trials. And I know that for a fact because it's really hard to get grants uh, to get your clinical trials running or even do the basic bench work research uh, that leads to clinical trials. But for me, as a nurse working at the bedside and the chair side, the most important resource that we have for clinical trials are the patients. You can develop those drugs, you can look at the pathways, but when you don't have patients enrolling in the clinical trials, that's all for nothing. right? And we cannot apply all those things that we're developing, that we're finding out, that we're discovering in the labs, and we're not applying it to patients because we don't have the patients to apply them to. Pointless. We've spent all those money for nothing. So you are our biggest resource. We need patients to enroll in clinical trials for us to be able to keep uh, improving cancer care. So here's another quote from Dr. Swain. Uh, who was the president of the American Society for Clinical Oncology. The dramatic trends and the progress we are making would have been unthinkable without the engine that drives life-saving cancer treatment. And that is clinical cancer research or clinical trials. So these are some of the advances uh, that we have seen in the past couple of years. In melanoma, 40% of patients are now achieving long-term remissions. Uh, so that number was very dismal before. 40% uh, is good uh, if, if you compare it to what we had before in melanoma. Lung cancer, we used to not have anything. We can't offer anything for patients with lung cancer, particularly small cell lung cancer. But because of the immuno-oncology research that's going on right now, uh, we're seeing patients actually live longer as a result of targeted uh, therapies and immunotherapies. We talked about leukemia and lymphoma. So T-cell therapies have 90% remission rates, 90%. You even expect that number uh, in people with advanced cancer. It used to be you will not be able to survive a leukemia or lymphoma without a bone marrow transplant. Now we even have drugs before you get to a bone marrow transplant uh, that has helped improve our numbers. The model for clinical trials would be our pediatric patients. Uh, and I'll tell you why in a minute. I'll tell you why now. Uh, so for, for many of us, for, for all of us in this room, so I don't see any pediatric patients in this room, uh, we either go to an academic medical center like UCLA or Cedars-Sinai, and yes, they have a robust clinical trial engine and they get offered those clinical trials. But there's a large group that also goes to private oncology clinics and private oncology practices where they may not have a lot of those clinical trials that are offered. Uh, so that's the reason why maybe less than 30% of adults uh, are even offered the option to enroll in clinical trials. Uh, that number varies, but 30% of adults enroll in clinical trials. And most of those uh, adults that are enrolled in clinical trials go to the big centers. Uh, and St. John's and John Wayne Cancer Center is one of that uh, with, with all the research that's going on. Pediatrics, why am I calling them the model of care? Where do children's, uh, children with cancer go? 
Shriners Children's Hospital, Children's Hospital of LA, Children's Hospital of Orange County, Children's Hospital of San Diego. It is very rare that you have oncology, private oncology centers for pediatric patients, right? And so all those children's hospitals, the Chalks and the CHSDs and the RADIs, uh, uh, City of Hope, they offer the clinical trials. So a lot more pediatric patients get offered to join in the clinical trial. We could also talk about the parents making the decision for the kids. So that's probably why the numbers are higher. But it primarily is because they go to a center that has a clinical trial. That's why a vast majority of kids are actually enrolled in clinical trials when compared to adults, uh, where adults go to uh, private oncology practices. Uh, and the outcomes for kids are much, much better than what we're seeing in adults. Even in leukemia, we have a lot of childhood acute leukemias. 98 to 99% of them will be cured from leukemia. Uh, or will be in remission for a very long time from leukemia uh, because of those clinical trials that happens in kids. So that's a really good model to look at in terms of the value of clinical trials and just recruiting them and getting them involved uh, in clinical trials. Breast cancer, uh, that's another area that's uh, you know, widely gaining recognition for what they're doing in clinical trials. There's a lot of different colors. You know, we always see pink for cancer, for breast cancer. Uh, there's a lot of uh, PR around pink and breast cancer, so that means there's a lot of monies in breast cancer, and that's why there's a lot more breast cancer research that's going on, uh, which also translates to better outcomes if you look at the treatments that are available for, for breast cancer. So for, for those of us in the room that may have other diagnosis, other cancer, it's really important for us to advocate for your cancer as well, to get more monies into the cancer, uh, cancer your whatever specific diagnosis you have, uh, to get the research going and moving forward as well. I already mentioned this, every new treatment for cancer was tested in a clinical trial. None of the drugs that we're using right now would be approved or would even be available for us if it had not gone through a clinical trial. Uh, when I talked about the importance of uh, humans, human subjects, you guys, the participants in clinical trials, the faster the trials find participants, the faster uh, that proven new treatments can get to the patients. The faster it will be for us to make those treatments available for you. So today we are seeing rapid dramatic progress, rapid dramatic progress in cancer treatment. There's a lot of new treatments, a lot of new targeted therapies. Uh, you probably have heard of the traditional chemotherapies in the past. You know, we're not seeing a lot of those anymore. Uh, we're seeing more immunotherapies and targeted therapies that are being developed. And there's also an emphasis on quality of life now as we continue to do our clinical trials. So it's, it's not just looking at the number of weeks or months or years that we've added on to survival. It's also the quality of life. That a lot of our clinical trials are less toxic. There are still toxicities, don't get me wrong. Uh, but they are uh, maybe less toxic or we are better able to manage those toxicities to keep you in the treatment that you will need uh, for us to be able to get rid of the cancer. See, I mentioned 30% earlier, but according to st statistics, only 4% of adult cancer patients ever participate in a clinical trial. So my number was uh, grossly uh, overestimated. I thought it was 30%. 4% of adult patients are enrolled in clinical trials. I know for a fact that for pediatrics, it's 60% and above. Many people who could potentially benefit from trials are unaware of them. They're not even offered. Uh, usually what happens is that after you get your diagnosis, the physician, the oncologist will tell you that this is the standard of care. So if you have breast cancer, we'll do AC, adriamycin cyclophosphamide, right? If you have lymphoma, we can do ABVD, adriamycin, bleomycin, vinblastin, uh, dexamethasone. There are those established treatments uh, that after you get diagnosed, that is the first thing that will be offered. Uh, and maybe clinical trials are not being made available to patients as well. So there's, there's a lot of that problem. There are some groups of patients, particularly minorities, uh, older people, women, who are underrepresented in clinical trials. If you look at the reports for the clinical trials that are published in leading medical journals, uh, anywhere from 50 to 90% of the participants are 
white Caucasians. Uh, so we need more diversity in terms of subjects for clinical trials. The, the subjects for the clinical trials or the participants need to actually reflect the U.S. population, right? We need Hispanics in there. We need Asian Americans, African Americans. Uh, and it, it needs to reflect that demographic. Uh, but currently, uh, that's not happening. We still have a lot of uh, uh, white Caucasians uh, that are participating in the clinical trials. And as you already uh, know, progress will be slow when we're unable to recruit patients. So if we need 20 patients for a clinical trial, it takes us three to five years to get those 20 patients. Think about the number of years uh, that it took and that it will take uh, for us to just complete the data, analyze the data, and publish the report. It will take years. Uh, not sure if the numbers are still correct, uh, but when I started talking about clinical trials, uh, the report was that 17 years, you know, before all this translational stuff. It takes about 17 years for a new molecule to make it to the market as an FDA-approved drug. So it's about 17 years. And imagine if you have a cancer patient, you don't have 17 years to wait, right? Uh, so part of that is recruiting it to clinical trials. This is Dr. David Carbone from uh, Ohio State University. I firmly believe that the best care for people with cancer, uh, for people with cancer, is care received in a clinical trial. So I try to offer that option to every one of my patients. Now, what did we talk about? Academic medical centers versus freestanding oncology clinics. Dr. Carbone is from the James Cancer Center at Ohio State University. So that's an academic medical center. We ha they have the clinical trials that they can or offer the patients. So if you look at every facility where patients go to, you will see that those numbers may be 30%, like the number that I quoted earlier for academic medical centers. But at a private uh, oncology clinic, it may be less than 4% of those patients who actually will be enrolled in a clinical trial. How do clinical trials work? Before the drug or the molecule or the agent or whatever it is, maybe a device, uh, before it's available to you, it has already undergone extensive testing. So there is preclinical research that happens uh, in the backstage, if you will, uh, that actually will test the safety and efficacy of, of those drugs outside of the human body. Uh, the clinical trial is the important piece because after we have determined safety and efficacy outside of the human body, whether in test, test tubes or, or animal models, uh, then the clinical trials will determine safety and efficacy in humans. Uh, so a lot of research has already happened in the background before those drugs are even available uh, for clinical trials. Those drugs uh, need to show promise effectivity that if there's a specific target that they need to do, then it actually must be able to target that particular biomarker, right? If it's a biomarker or, or it's, if it's a monoclonal antigen, that there must be a specific antibody that it binds to. If that doesn't happen in the background, then it's not even going to make it uh, to human clinical trials. So all those are being done in the background by our researchers here uh, to make sure that uh, when the drugs are available to us, to the public, that we've already done all those uh, safety and efficacy testing. It's called preclinical research. After preclinical research, we'll use those same drugs that have been proven safe and effective outside of a human. We will start using them on humans. How many of you have, uh, how many of you have heard about the phases of clinical trials? There are four, right? Phase one, two, three, and four. Uh, and just by looking at that, if you look at a clinical trial, it will say a phase one study of, you already know what we're trying to figure out. Phase one studies, we're looking at safety safety of the drug. Technically, we're not even looking at efficacy. I shouldn't say that we don't care if it works, but really that's not the goal of a phase one trial. We really are just looking at safety, and if it works for the cancer that you have, then that's just a icing on the cake. That's really great for our patients. Uh, but, but the main goal of a phase one trial is to look at safety. After we've determined the dose that we will use to start with in humans, so we start that dose in a cohort of patients, the most common Phase one clinical trial uh, sampling used is the three plus three. So we'll get three patients. We'll give them a, you know, whatever the starting dose is, the initial dose. Uh, and if all those three patients actually tolerate the dose, they don't have any adverse effects, 
then we will increase the dose and get another three patients. If none of those patients will have an adverse reaction to the drug, there are no side effects, we will increase the dose and get another three patients until we see a toxicity in one of those patients. If there's a toxicity in just one of the patients and we stay at that dose, we'll have to test another three at the same dose. And if the second set of three in the same dose, if one of them will have a toxicity, then we'll stop at that. Uh, so that's why it's called a safety study. We're looking at how much dose uh, will lead to a toxicity or a side effect in the patients that are being tested. So phase one trials is the first use in humans. The goal is to evaluate safety and identify the side effects. And uh, as I mentioned, it's usually in a small group of patients with different kinds of cancers. Why is it so difficult to run a phase one study in cancer? Because of the toxicities of the drugs, right? Every other diagnosis that I mentioned, that we mentioned earlier, like diabetes and hypertension, uh, they have phase one studies for all the drugs that we're using for them. But they could pull from the street and actually get a sample from the street because all of us will have blood pressures, right? So I can pull a sample from the street, I could pull anyone from the street and have them enroll in, this, in, in a clinical trial to test if a drug can actually lower high blood pressure. Uh, and it not, doesn't have a lot of toxicity. So you don't have to have the diagnosis for those other, other types of drugs. But in cancer, because of the toxicities and the mechanism of action, you do have to have the cancer to be able to enroll in a phase one trial. Uh, and that's what makes it really difficult for the cancer community, cancer researchers, to get more samples, more participants in phase one <coughs> clinical trials for cancer. <coughs> So I said this, phase one trials are not actually designed to test how well a new drug or a combination of drug works. We, we don't look at efficacy, we measure efficacy, but that's not the purpose of a phase one trial. Uh, although we are hoping that for some patients who actually sign up for uh, the trial that it will benefit them, that it will provide them with some benefits. Phase one trial will provide important data to help decide the dose uh, that the patients who will uh, receive the drugs in the phase two will be. Phase two clinical trials, we're now looking at efficacy. So we know what the safe dose is to use. We will start with that safe dose and see if it actually works in either reducing the cancer growth or just stopping, stopping the cancer or getting rid of the cancer altogether. So it provides more information about the safety and also this time we're looking at efficacy if the drug actually works. Uh, it takes about two years, involves a larger number of patients, so we don't do the three plus three here, we just get uh, uh, patients usually in the range of about uh, 100 to 300, uh, and, and we'll look at the, continue to look at the safety and efficacy if this drug will shrink the tumor or stop its growth. It may involve randomization to different treatment approaches. You may have two arms, standard of care versus uh, uh, arm B or there may be multiple arms depending on the dose uh, of the drug. Phase three trials are the most common trials that, that are, are offered and that you may be familiar with or some of you may be enrolled in. Uh, so this is what I was talking about earlier where we are actually comparing the new agent or the new drug to standard of care. Uh, I mentioned earlier, just to give you an example, we can read through the slides. You need more patients for these studies, upwards of 300 to thousands of patients, right? Uh, it's not local to the US alone. Sometimes we'll have partners in Europe or in Asia who will be running the same clinical trials. Uh, and there are very specific measures for success or failure. The tumor should have shrunk at least 50% when we look at CT scan. So it's very, very specific. Uh, but what's really important to know about phase three clinical trials is that it's always compared to standard of care. I'll give you one example. I talked about breast cancer earlier, and for the longest time, the standard of care for breast cancer was AC, like a stage three, stage four breast cancer. It's adriamycin cyclophosphamide, right? So that is the standard of care. If you were diagnosed with breast cancer in the 1980s, you are 80% likely to have been offered AC. And then we have Taxotere, or we have uh, Docetaxel, uh, or Trastuzumab, the new agents that we're using for breast cancer. So we started developing those drugs, we solved targets, we developed drugs. So now we have to add those drugs into AC. So now we have ACT. So when, when Trastuzumab uh, was in a clinical trial, 
no, it was added to AC as one of the arms. So half of the patients got the standard of care that we know is effective in breast cancer, and then the other half got AC plus the new agent, trastuzumab or Herceptin. You were probably more familiar with that. Uh, it's not that simple, though. So to be able to, to uh, be enrolled in that group with a trastuzumab, you have to be HER2 positive. So those, those are some of the things that we will look at. Well, you have to have the, mark, the marker, the biomarker, that will make you respond to that particular drug. Right? Uh, so that's, those are all the specifics of clinical trials. But really, the main lesson here is uh, you're not just getting the drug. You know, and, and there's no arm that is a in the strictest sense of the term, there's no placebo arm alone. Like that placebo is standard of care. You will always have the standard of care compared to the new drug. And then phase four trials are those drugs that have already been approved that are available in the market that we're continuing to collect data from. Uh, so those, uh, the data will be evaluated by the FDA, will be evaluated by the researchers. And if there are side effects or adverse events uh, that uh, may be very concerning to the principal investigators or the FDA, they may pull the drug off the market. Uh, so that's, that's what happens with phase four clinical trials as uh, the drugs already are available and we're just continuing to address those. When we talked about the phase three trial and the very specific uh, things that they evaluate to measure the response, these are some of the things that you will hear from the physicians. Or if you uh, actually pull up articles that are published in medical journals, these are some of the things that they report on. Overall survival. So how much longer do the patients survive after receiving the drug? What is the problem with overall survival? That is always reported, but that's not just, uh, they don't report overall survival alone. So let me tell you one of the biggest problems with overall survival is that if a patient dies from any other cause, like you're on a clinical trial, you left St. John's and you get run over as you cross Santa Monica Boulevard, then your overall survival is one day after receiving the drug. It doesn't mean the drug was not effective, <laughs> you see? Right, but, but your overall survival was short, was cut short because of something else that happened. So overall survival alone uh, is not indicative of, uh, alone, it's not indicative of efficacy of the drug because there are other things could have happened that may have shortened your overall survival. So a lot of the researchers actually look at other things like progression-free survival. And that is, uh, if we were able to shrink your tumor with the clinical trial, how long does it take for the tumor to start growing back up? Disease-free survival, if you were able to induce remission, you're already in remission, your physician told you that the cancer is undetectable, how long does it take before the cancer comes back? It's disease-free survival. So those are some of the things that they will evaluate in addition to overall survival. Uh, that actually tells us much better the efficacy of the drug. Uh, and then complete remission is uh, if the drug has completely eradicated the cancer, you'd be in complete remission. So how long does that happen? And how, what percentage of the patients who were put on the clinical trial on the drug actually went into complete remission? So those, those are, are some of the things that are required. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, complete remission, what length of time would you know, physicians believe that is? Because uh, in my stage four lymphoma, I've had right. for 16 years, it goes you know, three years into remission comes out again, another three years into remission comes out again, and I just... So the definition of complete remission is when they do an evaluation, they're not able to detect the cancer. So whatever length of time that took. Usually they would wait until you complete the cycle, right? Like one cycle, uh, one cycle of chemo, it's every three weeks for up to six cycles. Uh, so three weeks times six, that's about, what, three months? So after three months, you get an evaluation. And if they're completely unable to detect the cancer, there was nothing that you see on a scan, there are no blood markers, you know, like a PSA for prostate cancer, if all those are negative, then they would say you're in complete remission for that particular time. Uh, and then if they do an evaluation again and the numbers start coming back up or something lights up in a CT scan, uh, then that would be that disease-free survival, uh, that cancer actually has come back, whether in the same site or different site. Right, no matter how many years. Right. 
Uh, the other part that may be confusing to people is the definition of cure in cancer. So complete remission, anytime that they do an evaluation and they're unable to detect the cancer, that's complete remission. But cure, they don't usually throw that word around. Uh, but when they do, they usually wait five years. That you're in complete remission for at least five years before they say you're cured. And then they're using no evidence of disease right. now. Right. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so every person facing cancer should talk uh, to your providers uh, about whether clinical trial is an option for you. Uh, and I know that this is very difficult for a lot of the patients. Uh, depending on where you are here in the U.S., we're more self-advocates for ourselves, right? Uh, we, we are able to argue with our physicians. We're able to talk to our physicians. Some of you may have already requested for a second opinion, and that's all great, and I totally encourage that. Uh, but there are other cultures and other countries and other ethnicities who may not be as vocal. Uh, so uh, we need to actually spread the word uh, that it is okay to ask your, your providers if clinical trial would be an option for them. When you sign up for a clinical trial, you will uh, receive informed consent. There is a uh, misconception that an informed consent is a signature on a paper. That is the informed consent form uh, that you're signing uh, on the paper and your physician is signing. Basically, your signature uh, says or tells us that you have had the discussion. So the informed consent is not the form. It's the discussion that happened. Your physician should have told you the risks and benefits. So what are the benefits that you will get from joining this clinical trial? What are the risks based on the, the studies that we have done? in the backstage, during the preclinical trial phase of, of, a clinic, uh, of a research. Uh, what are those risks? Uh, more importantly, what are the benefits? And then there's a third part that usually is uh, not covered and not discussed. We always talk about risks and benefits. What are your other options? It's, it's very important that options are discussed as well. So all those are part of informed consent, the process of informed consent. You don't have to sign uh, immediately when you're offered to join a clinical trial. You can ask your provider for more information. You can go online uh, to clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, I think one of the slides will show that later if you want to read up on the clinical trial. There's a patient portal uh, for clinicaltrials.gov uh, that explains uh, you know, the, the clinical trial in layman's term uh, that may be more acceptable for, for many of our patients and our families. Uh, so think about the clinical trial, talk to your family. It will not be easy joining a clinical trial because uh, that does not only mean you're going to uh, the clinical trial center where there's an academic medical center uh, or your physician's office. You have a lot of tests, so you will have more visits. You will have more time in the waiting room. I'm saying it as it is. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, right? There's going to be a lot more visits and a lot more of those waiting, uh, a lot more blood draws. Uh, but also, you have the benefits that you may get uh, from, from the clinical trial. You can and should definitely ask uh, another session if you have more questions. Uh, don't ever feel that you're taking time away from the provider or the clinical research associate or the clinical research nurse. That is their job. That is our job to provide you with the information. Uh, so make sure you have all the information uh, you'll need before you make a decision. And again, always make a decision with your family because uh, your family member, your husband or your wife or your daughter or your son will be taking you to your appointments, and whether you sign on that dotted line or not will involve them as well, because that will impact their schedule and time as well. You had a question, sir. Yeah, it says uh, the team, is that your team with your surgeon or team with for this, this part? Uh, I'm kind of confused. Which? Does my team go? Oh, yes. The that's that's the, the medical team. Yeah, my so, team. Right, your medical team. So your, your oncologist and the clinical research associate and the clinical research nurse, maybe the clinical pharmacist, the research pharmacist. Uh, so every single one of them have a different role. And you may have that interface, that uh, encounter with every one of them or a few of them. Uh, and they will provide you all the information. They should provide you with all the information that you need to be able to make that decision if you want to enroll in a clinical trial. I had I just had a Whipple surgery, mm -hmm. and I don't know if we, I'm gonna have to find yeah. out if I qualify. Yeah. But, uh, 
more help than there. <laughs> right. Yeah, so talk to your team. Uh, your clinical research associate would be the best person to talk to, and then they can pull in whoever uh, you, you'll need uh, to, to talk to you. We have another question. Uh, how do you know which phase you are in? Are you informed of that? Yes. Do you have a choice? Definitely. No, no. Uh, it's not a you know one trial you can get in phase one, two, three, and four. It doesn't work that way. So all the drugs will be in phase one first, and then we'll close the phase one trial. We'll move it to phase two, and then we'll close the phase two trial, and we'll move into phase three. Uh, right, and then you will know that what phase you're in. Uh, that that is part of the informed consent. Uh, but it's it's you know, like multiple phases within trial. Uh, that's that's not generally uh, how they schedule and then uh, design the trials. What stage, stage of cancer, do you look for clinical trials? In other words, if I were stage at one, two, and three, if I chose to do a clinical trial, when there's still a gold standard that may work, am I doing that to become a, be a good citizen in the community to provide the data? Versus, I can see if I were phase four. Like uh, Dr. Carbone said earlier, he offers clinical trials to all his patients. So regarding of the phase, they may, there may not be a trial uh, that's available for you at a stage one. Because again, like I mentioned earlier, surgery will cure the cancer, right? If it's a melanoma, melanoma diagnosed at stage one, just take it out, done. Uh, if you want to be a good citizen, there may be clinical trials where they'll get a sample of that melanoma after it's taken uh, after it's surgically removed, and all our lab folks will actually study the, the tissue itself. Uh, but uh, in terms of available clinical trials, it really depends on, on what's out there. Uh, and clinical trials changes, so some of them will close, some of them will open. It, it depends on the time that you're diagnosed and uh, what's available out there that may be offered to you. But having said that, there, there may not be one uh, if you're at stage one. Yeah, so we're really saying it's stage Top stage of one, two, or three, what right. is the benefit to me versus the community? Is there a benefit to There's, me? Yes. Uh, how do I even phrase this? Uh, a phase three trial would be a lot more benefit for you than a phase one, obviously, right? right. So the, is, that, is that the... No, I think he's asking about this. Cancer stage. Yeah, my, I'm talking about the cancer stage. If I'm in stage one, two, or three, I guess I'm still looking at the gold standard to be effective. And there's a very right. good, I, you'd have to talk about the probabilities and stuff. So, if I, okay. so why would I then join a trial when, because of the added visits to doctors, discomfort, and stuff like that, when there's still a new potential for a cure? So when do I make that decision to look for the trial if I'm stage two or stage three of the cancer? Not a trial. Right. So what we've talked about earlier, uh, you will always, to ha will always have the gold standard, the standard of care, whether you're phase one, phase two, or phase three. And the clinical trial will be added to that standard of care. And yes, it will involve a lot more visits, but that's your contribution to society as the visits that you will do. But in terms of your specific cancer, then you will always have that standard of care. Uh, for, for a stage one, because we're really talking about a stage one, which is curable, surgically accessible. Uh, so that, that's more of a contribution to society kind of issue for, for a stage one. Yes. Do most clinical trials start in a stage four uh, type setting, like myself? No, no clinical trials. Like like I mentioned earlier, it's it's available not just in treatments, but in uh, it's not just in treatments. We use it for uh, diagnostics as well, and so a, a there might be a stage one clinical trial for diagnosis, for early diagnosis. So I mean those kinds of things, but. Obviously, you've already been diagnosed. You know you have a stage one, but you may be able to help future patients get diagnosed earlier. And so that will be a lot more contribution too. All right. Yes. I find it disconcerting that there are a lot of trials that you hear about that start, and then four years later you don't hear anything about them. Right. 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 And then you go to the government website and you don't find any information about them. So I get the feeling that they fail. 
Yes. And that's, that's okay. But I, I guess I, it makes me very weary because they never talk right. about that. They keep it in like a dark secret right. somewhere. That's, that's a very good point, and it talks to more us, the healthcare providers and the researchers, because uh, there is an aversion to publish negative results. Uh, that doesn't give you any academic credibility, or I mean, it should, because you've already found one thing that doesn't work. Uh, but most, most of the researchers, most of the medical field will not publish negative results. So that's, that's a very good point, though, that we actually will need to push up maybe to the NIH so that they will encourage negative negative yeah, publications, yeah, negative research. No, that, that's changed. Right. If that's they changed. want us to yeah. participate, if they're not going to tell us when they don't work. The reason why it takes 17 years for a new agent to begin to market is because we have a lot of those failures in between, see? Uh, and, and we're not seeing the, the failures published in papers, but you'll see that one golden paper that actually will prove the efficacy for, for most of the time. So that's what we changing right now. So the most important journals, like Lancet, German, New England Journal of Medicine, are accepting the trials. Yes. So because we don't want to have the same mistake two times. Right. So we don't have to want to expose patients two times to the same drug. We know it's not that efficacy as the other ones. And this is a specific medical meeting to show negative so we don't call this negative. They're not negative. They're just not showing improvement. Right. Yeah. Right. Good. Good point. Good question. I was wondering, how can you validate the effectiveness and the safety of the pharmaceutical drugs to prevent cancer if you don't have a more diverse trial population based on ethnicity, poverty, right? Toxicity. I That is, and that is why we have phase four. Uh, so, like I mentioned earlier, uh, many of the patients that get enrolled in the phase one, two, and three trials, uh, 50 to 90 percent of them would be Caucasians. There's not a lot of diversity. Uh, so, whatever works may be working because of their ethnicity, right? We, we don't know uh, what makes it work for this particular population, but it has worked and it's safe, so we will make it available. Now we continue to look at phase four trials when that drug becomes available to the general public and we'll see more diversity in the patients receiving the drugs. And that's where we get the data from uh, in terms of this. We do. That is uh, one of the reasons why the cancer support community has this class because we want the general public to know about clinical trials and we want to be able to recruit people of all ethnicities, of all backgrounds uh, into the study, uh, into studies so that we can get that uh, good sampling of uh, diversity, uh, diverse uh, population. I'll take one more question and then we'll go through the slides and we'll open up again later. You mentioned ethnicity, uh, there's white, brown, or yellow. Right. Uh, <coughs> but there is no ethnicity for a mix. You know, like my descendant would be part Asian, part right. Caucasian. So what do they do? So the, the multiple race. The NIH right now has the category, the five different ethnic categories, right? You have the Asian American, you have, uh, and being an Asian myself, like I fall under Asians, but Chinese and Japanese Asians are very different from Filipino Asians. Uh, in terms of a lot of things, like we don't use chopsticks, I mean, we're using that, but uh, uh, in terms of not just the diet, but it, it's very different. It's a very diverse, uh, Asians itself uh, is a very diverse group, but we're all clumped under Asians. So that is a good point. We're uh, addressing that. Like there are groups uh, at the NIH looking into how to break down ethnicities and even the more complex multiracial types uh, that, that were there. We're seeing more and more in our in our culture now. So. so this is a quote from a patient who was involved in a trial. Uh, Shannon, we knew from the beginning that a clinical trial was the way to go. My cancer is rare, and I was diagnosed with a stage four disease. Standard therapy did not offer much hope. We started looking right away, and we're 
willing to go anywhere where they had trials uh, for my cancer. So we, we know of those patients who actually will travel to where the trials are. If a trial is not offered here in Southern California at UCLA, City of Hope, St. John's, uh, some patients actually will fly to MD Anderson in Texas or Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York uh, where some of those trials are offered or Duke University for uh, uh, the vaccine trials for GBM. Uh, they're offered everywhere else. It's, it's a matter of, I told you earlier, it's not going to be easy. There's the travel involved. So travel may not be driving down the 405 in LA. Travel may include the flight uh, to, to where the trials are offered as well. So it makes it even more difficult to recruit patients in clinical trials. I was at the NIH for 10 weeks years ago, uh, maybe 2007, 2008. And the NIH, because it's a government entity and they have the funds, whatever trial is offered at the NIH, if you qualify for their trials, they will fly you there. You get to stay there. I mean, everything is paid for. Uh, but I don't know how many visits uh, <laughs> will involve specific to the trial. Uh, but but those, are, those trials are available. So I mentioned this. If you want to look at trials yourself, there's clinicaltrials.gov. There's a search button. You can type in your cancer. I can tell you right now it will be so overwhelming. Because if you type in melanoma, uh, it will throw in thousands upon thousands of clinical trials, different stages of melanoma, different tumor sizes, different markers. Uh, so you will need someone to help you digest the data and then evaluate the data and analyze the data to see uh, what really may be good for you or maybe an option for you. So it's important that you discuss that with the provider, with your oncologist, uh, and not just go out there on your own. But we do have patients uh, coming to the clinic with like pages upon pages of clinical trials. And it's like, I've done my research. Tell me which one's best for me. I think. Can you get a question? Yes. So I've got a rare cancer. Would I be better off to go to a clinical trial? Particularly for rare cancers, I would say, personally, so, yes. So pancreatic cancer. Yes. Yes. All right. Good. I'm sorry, I didn't get this question. Oh, so for someone with a rare cancer, would it be better to enroll in a clinical trial? And, and my personal opinion is yes. Because uh, uh, rare cancers usually are those we, not, we don't have an established standard of care yet, apart from the Whipple surgery. I have a colleague who's an oncology nurse at UCSD working in the infusion center, was also diagnosed with, uh, uh, with pancreatic cancer, had a Whipple at UCSD. We have an excellent surgeon there, and he's still working as a nurse. Uh, so three years, I think it's been three years, or maybe just under three years right now. And he's working. Excuse yeah. me, if you apply for a clinical trial, does it apply in your key and you do the paperwork is, it, uh, is there a possibility that you could be denied? We'll talk about that. So it's, it's all about the eligibility, though. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's all the eligibility, but we'll, we'll talk about that. If you're eligible, they will not turn you away because they need you. <laughs> right. But if, if you have something that doesn't meet the criteria to be enrolled in that clinical trial, so that's, uh, yeah, you're not eligible for the trial. It's not that they're denying you, but you're not eligible, so they may need to look for other options for you. Uh, so finding a clinical trial, you have to know your specific cancer type. And lung cancer doesn't cut it. You need to know what specific type of lung cancer. It is a small cell lung cancer, an adenocarcinoma. You will see all that in the pathology report, which you should have access to. You can always ask your physician for a copy of your medical record. You have the right, according to the government, to have access to that. So you will see what stage your cancer is, what your specific diagnosis is. If they've sent the specimens out for molecular testing, you will even see those molecular tests on there. So you make sure you have all that information if you're looking for a clinical trial. But as I mentioned, the language is very complicated, so you will need help filtering through all those that you will find online. Uh, and it's always best uh, to discuss it with your physician, with your medical team. Uh, this is from a husband, a caregiver of a patient with cancer. My wife was a market researcher and very good at finding information online, but we were completely confused. So your ability to navigate the internet, the web, is not a guarantee that you will be able to find the appropriate trial for you because it, it, there's a lot more complexity to identifying the appropriate clinical trial than just navigating the web. 
So why don't people participate? Some of, uh, some of participants think that they're a guinea pig. You know, they're doing experiments on me. We've already, I've already explained what a phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four trial entails, and how standard of care is always an option, uh, one of the arms, and you will always get the standard of care. So this is definitely a myth. There's no guinea pigs uh, in, in clinical trials anymore. There are experimental studies. There, is, there are very strict controls over those studies. Placebo issue, I think we did talk about that. In cancer clinical trials, specific to cancer clinical trials, technically there's no placebo. It'll be very, very hard to get uh, the human subjects review board to approve uh, a clinical trial that has a placebo as one arm alone. It may happen very, very rarely, and if it does, it will be explained to you, but very, very rare. Uh, most of a majority, a vast majority of the clinical trials for cancer will involve standard of care. Choosing doctors or treatment centers. This is a very big issue that I myself had uh, encountered. So my aunt who lives in Long Beach was diagnosed with breast cancer. She wanted to get involved in a clinical trial. I referred her to St. John's uh, for our surgeon here. But then she has to go through her insurance to change the doctors. That I cannot fix right now. So that is something that we will need help with. Cancer support community is here to help you with that. But there's a lot of added work that needs to happen if you want to switch providers, if you want to, you know, insurance issues, uh, switching to a clinical trial. Uh, that may be a problem, but uh, that should really not discourage you from, from finding clinical trials. It, it will involve a lot of work, though. Not, no one place have trials for everyone. So it doesn't matter how big the portfolio is for clinical trials for UCLA or for Cedars or for St. John's, right? They will all have different trials. They'll have different uh, mechanisms of actions of the drug, like I mentioned earlier, specific to brain tumor. Duke University has the virus trials that we may not be able to offer here. So it's just a matter of finding uh, what option is available for you. Uh, locally versus outside of uh, your local commuting area. Cost may be an issue, but if you actually fit the bill, if you fit the description for a clinical trial, if you meet the eligibility criteria, you don't have to pay for the drug, you don't have to pay for any tests that is outside of the standard of care. That should all be covered under the clinical trial license by the principal investigator, by the hospital, by the organization. So that should not incur any cost. Even parking, uh, if you're in a clinical trial, you shouldn't be paying for it because the clinical trial should be paying for the parking for your visits. Ask your clinical research associates for that. They built that in when we get the contracts from the pharma companies whenever we negotiate clinical trials with them. So it should not add a, it should not add a burden to the patient and the family to get involved in a clinical trial, and we'll try to make it as convenient for you as possible uh, if you qualify for the clinical trial, if you meet all the criteria. Right, so outside of the standard of care, right? So if the clinical trial says you have to see a doctor three times a week, uh, then the other two visits you shouldn't have to pay for. There should not be any bill. It will be billed under the clinical trial. But if you normally see your doctor every six weeks, then that will still be billed to your insurance. Anything on top of that that's part of the trial will not be billed. It should, the cost should be charged to the clinical trial. So what about insurance if they completely deny that do you, uh, is it covered or you just, you're just out of luck? So with the insurance, they will pay for the standard of care. So they can deny the standard of care. And then there's the appeals process after. Uh, but technically, they cannot deny a clinical trial because that's outside of their, they're not paying for the clinical trial. So they cannot deny a clinical trial. They can deny the standard of care. Uh, and that may be a problem when you're actually in a phase three trial and you fall under standard of care versus a you know, clinical trial, right? It, it really just depends on what the organization has negotiated with the company. Uh, so that's why it specifically says here, if you encounter other costs, including parking, <laughs> talk to your doctor, because those are available. If you're at John Wayne, where I work, they always, parking is always a line item. Uh, that if you're in a clinical trial, you get parking paid for. Yeah. And then there's uh, suspicion or distrust of the medical profession. Uh, you know, the, uh, 
what trials were those? The, the Tuskegee trials, right? Uh, so that, that has always been mentioned in terms of ethics. Uh, the syphilis trials back in, what, the 50s, 40s? Uh, that has created a lot of distrust in the African American community and the, the healthcare uh, profession. Uh, so that some of those still linger on, uh, and that's the, some of the reasons why patients would not want to get enrolled in clinical trials. Uh, but we're really trying to change that. All the clinical trials that we have open available now are very well regulated uh, by the hospitals and by the FDA. Let's see what time is it. But the single most important reason why people, why patients don't participate in the clinical trials is that they're never offered the option. They're not aware of the clinical trials. So we need to change that. Uh, for those of you in the room, you need to start asking your physicians, is there a clinical trial that may be available for me? Uh, now we have to work on those outside the room, right? Uh, and then make sure that they actually advocate for themselves uh, to, to ask for clinical trials. I've mentioned this earlier, you need to be willing to get a second opinion, talk to a different oncologist. That is standard. You should not, the physician should not get offended when you ask for a second opinion. It's your life, you have the right, right? It's your life, you have the right to manage your own life. So ask for a second opinion. Uh, Why are doctors more aggressive in presenting the trials? Is it because they don't know? They may not be aware of the clinical trials. They may not have the options available to them. Uh, a number of factors. Or uh, we have some that, you know, standard of care it works just as well. So why? Yeah. Yes. If I'm involved in a clinical trial, let's say phase three, typically how often do I go for visits? Because if I'm doing it, out of state, that could be an issue. Yeah. That's a very good question. And every clinical trial is different. Uh, so there are phase three clinical trials of oral p oncology pills, oral cancer pills. So you don't even need to come in to take those oral pills, right? They will call you for a follow-up. Uh, you may need to come in every week for a blood draw. Uh, as opposed to a clinical trial that may involve an IV administration of a drug that will require you to actually come in every so often to get the drug. So it, it really depends. Uh, the regimens vary depending on the clinical trial. But if I'm doing it out of state, that would be an issue. It will be an issue. Uh, so that's another factor to consider. Some of the bigger centers actually will have uh, like hospital-based hotels where they will have you come in and stay at their hotel while you're on the clinical trial. And they're paying for that. Sounds Over at what period of time? We don't know. It, it all depends on the trial. There's, there's a, a ton of clinical trials out there, so it really depends on the trial. Uh, but those are some of, the, some of what they do to actually uh, encourage patients to enroll in clinical trials, is to make all those available for them, to make it less uh, of an inconvenience for you to, to sign up for a clinical trial. You have a sheet with the websites? I do not, but uh, we'll ask the cancer. So are you on the mailing list for CSC? So, okay. yeah, so I'll, I'll ask them to send those out. Uh, just the clinicaltrials.gov, and there's a there's a, actually this la last slide on here that talks about other resources. Some some patients think that the clinical trial is the last ditch treatment, so they've tried everything else, and uh, the only reason for them to go to a clinical trial is that everything else failed. Uh, that, that, is, uh, that is a, uh, a thought process from some of the patients. The problem with that is if you wait until the last, you know, until the last treatment, you may be ineligible for a number of clinical trials because you've already received so many treatments. Uh, some of those treatments that you have received will make you ineligible for the trials. So those are part of the exclusion criteria for some of the trials. So it will make your options less and less. That is the reason why uh, we've talked all along, like at diagnosis. Dr. Carbone from Ohio State offers clinical trials right away before you even start getting all the other treatments uh, so that there's, uh, you, you don't have those exclusion criteria. Uh, yes? Actually, that was one of my questions. I always look at it like a last ditch, you know, last resort thing. But if you, for instance, I have like stage 3C and I have run recurrence and if you do clinical trial, does that harm going 
going back to some other traditional treatment that might be possible. Okay. And then also, um, if if you, you said one, I guess there was one thing where uh, there's some trials to prevent recurrence. Um, do you have to be in complete remission before you could be in that? Uh, just looking at, you know, thinking about the goal. So you, uh, prevent remission, then yes, you have to be in complete uh, remission. Uh, but then again, I always would go back to the inclusion and exclusion criteria because those are very specific uh, to each study. Uh, you have to, that's, that's the reason why you have to talk to your provi provider or the clinical research associate. Uh, some of those may need a clinically undetectable cancer. Some of those may say that if you have a tumor that's less than 10% of the original size, you qualify. So it, it really varies, uh, really varies. You need to talk to a healthcare provider uh, to evaluate those criteria. But it all goes down to the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So you really want to fit in whatever inclusion criteria they have and not have any of the exclusion criteria for you to be able to uh, be considered for, for those trials. If the patient is already on the treatment, can they still qualify for the If treatment? the treatment is not an exclusion to the trial, yes. Yes, you can switch mid-treatment. Mid uh, Oh, if the question was if a patient is already already receiving treatment and then decides to consider a clinical trial, can they enroll? As long as the treatment is not an exclusion criteria, yes. It, it depends on the trial itself. But yes, uh, that, that can happen. You will, you will evaluate that with your provider. They will see what's the best option for you. Remember, we always talk about the benefits and risks. So the be you'll always have to consider the benefits as well. Uh, if it's more beneficial for you to complete the cycle first before switching on to clinical trial as opposed to stopping uh, mid-treatment to switch to a trial, that will all be evaluated by your oncologist. So it's very important to talk to them. But that can happen. So the question, the short question, the short answer is yes, it can happen. We can switch mid-treatment. Why should you participate? You have access to the newest, the most innovative therapies excellent care and monitoring, a chance for your voice to be heard. Uh, and we've talked about contributing to society, contributing to the greater good and better future for everyone uh, who may uh, be diagnosed uh, after us. So lung cancer patient, I chose a trial because I really hope it would help my cancer. But I also felt very strongly that I was doing something important. If, I didn't, if it didn't work for me, it would help someone else. It would help people in the future. That meant a lot to me. Uh, so people have different reasons uh, for enrolling in clinical trials. How to communicate with your provider, with your physician team. Make sure uh, you just open up. Uh, bring up the option of a clinical trial. The question is, is there any clinical trial that may be appropriate for me? So you're not pushing it, right? Uh, if your doctor doesn't bring it up, ask. Using that same exact word that I use, is there a clinical trial that may be appropriate for me? Or uh, talk to nurse practitioners, nurses, your clinical research coordinators. They're very great resources of what's available out there as well. Uh, take the time to think about the trial. Get your research done. Uh, don't hesitate to get a second opinion. Some of us are still very iffy about that. Uh, and if you look for trials on your own, discuss what you find with your provider with your doctor. Make sure you have that discussion. Uh, future of clinical trials. Uh, used to be clinical trials is for lung cancers, for melanoma, right? What we're seeing more now, we have the umbrella trials from the NIH, uh, is that it doesn't matter where the organ is. If you have a specific marker, then you get involved in a clinical trial. Uh, we talked about breast cancer earlier, so HER2. So if you're HER2, positive, uh, that's, that's a specific marker. Whatever the cancer is, uh, you will get enrolled in a clinical trial. So if you look online, it will list all the different organs. But really, if you uh, look at the criteria, they're looking for a specific marker. So that's, that's where we're going more into clinical trials. We're looking more at the markers uh, and the specific drugs that target those markers. There's more flexibility in trial design. We have more efficient therapies. Uh, better patient participation, and definitely we're getting a lot more input from patients and caregivers and patient advocates uh, in terms of designing the clinical trials. 
These are some of the resources from the cancer support community. Uh, and I will make sure to tell them to send the email out uh, if you need the resources. And if you are not familiar with this yet, if you've been here before uh, at one of the Lunch and Learns, they always show the slides. So the cancer support community has the Cancer Experience Registry website where you go in, log in, uh, you help them, you provide them with your cancer experience, provide them with some data. They can talk more about that. They have flyers in the back. I'm not really familiar with the types of data that they will collect, uh, but this is available for you. You'll get more information from the cancer uh, support community as well when you register on their website. Uh, and to join, you can click on that link. So that's uh, specific to the cancer support community. Might there be uh, multiple clinical trials and at various stages that you might qualify for? And then you have to decide which one to jump in on? Yes and no. Uh, so there are different types of trials. Some of the therapeutic trials are very strict that you should not be on any other agent. So you cannot be on two clinical trials at the same time. But if you're doing a therapeutic trial plus a maybe a diagnostic trial that doesn't affect the drugs that you're getting, that's fine. Uh, but in terms of therapies, uh, most of the criteria are very strict that you need. Uh, you can only be enrolled in one trial. Uh, you can do serial trials. <laughs> like if this trial... Uh, either did not work for you or is causing a lot more side effects than, uh, than uh, you were expecting. And you want to switch to another trial, that's fine. But usually the multiple therapeutic trials are, are not standard of care. We, we rarely see that unless it's, it's a different type of trial. Yes. If you're on a particular regimen um, treatment already and you look for a clinical trial that's dealing with gold standard yes. versus their new drug, do you still get your standard of care that you have been getting, or do you switch? You can. Uh, the, the way the protocols are written, you can. So some of the sponsors, some of the pharma companies will actually evaluate it on a case-by-case -case basis, and they will approve, uh, even if it's outside of what their criteria is. So, so you can. Uh, doesn't happen all the time, but you can. Uh, there's, there's, there are ways that, that physicians will actually evaluate and, and try to uh, make you eligible for the trial, even if you're already taking something else. It, it really will fall on the principal investigator, and if he thinks that whatever you're taking will affect the results of the trial or not. Uh, but, but those things happen. All right. I think... Uh, Join the grassroots movement from the cancer support community. Obviously, uh, if you don't hear your voice, uh, no one's speaking up for you. So uh, my, my mentor always told me, if you're, if you're not on the table, you're on the menu. Right? Uh, so, so make sure you're at the table speaking up for, for your own cause. And some other resources from the cancer support community. All right. Oh. Yes. All right, so with that, I will open it up to more questions if you have other questions. Yes, ma'am. I have been I didn't participate, but, you know, for the trial. For the Could it be that the doctor decided that he can use one of those trials to give me a Without letting me know? No, not at all possible. No. Remember the informed consent that we talked about. You cannot be enrolled in a trial. You cannot receive any agents in the trial. Even if you fall in the standard of, uh, standard of care arm, they cannot include you in the trial without your knowledge. That, that, that cannot happen. So I'm thinking you may be getting standard of care outside of a clinical trial, uh, but you will never ever be in a trial. They will not collect data on you unless you know that you have been enrolled in a trial. Okay. Yes? Is, is there a radiation? Yep, so is there a radiation, a trial for radiation? Yes. So we've, we were only talking about drugs because uh, that's the most common, uh, most common trials that we often hear. Uh, but the ways to give radiation therapy depending on what cancer you have, whether a short burst high dose radiation or radiation divided into fractions, you know, those kinds of things. 
there are trials all over the place uh, looking at radiation or a combination of chemo and radiation. Yes, <laughs> yeah, there, are radi there are trials that would involve radiation as well. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.